Today, I am going to pull off a stunt that I guarantee no other YouTube miniature hobbyist has ever done. I will also attempt by far my most massive resin pour ever and continue to cleave my way through White Plume Mountain. Stick the F around. Hello everyone, Wylock here, welcome back, and I am psyched to be back at this project. Not a lot of rooms quantity-wise today, but a lot of interesting developments in them as I built them, so let me regale you with the tale of part four of my complete and unabridged construction of White Plume Mountain. All right, we gotta knock out some tedium here before we get to the fun stuff. Area 14, Flood Doors. The three doors along the corridor are made of thick metal, their edges flanged so that they overlap the door jamb on the north side and thus can only be opened by pivoting them to the north. The north side of each door has a handle, and these barriers are emergency doors. Their purpose is to prevent the dungeon from being flooded by the boiling lake in Area 15 in case of an accident. For all the nonsense in this dungeon, this is a pretty logical idea. I like it. These doors, like all, will be clip-ons, but they will be made in two pieces. Notice the single corrugated cardboard. Yes, a small half and a large half are made, and then they are joined together. And this creates that flanged feature that the text talks about. So you imagine if you're on the smaller side, you can push it open to the north, and if you're on the north side, you can pull it back with the handle. It's a check valve. So if the boiling lake that we're about to discuss backflows, these three check valves prevent the entire dungeon from being flooded. Good to know. Ominous, but good to know. Area 15, Boiling Lake. This boiling lake is several hundred feet deep. You know what? This is easier to just draw out for you. So it's a massive underground cave, several hundred feet deep. It's filled with water. It's an underground lake. At the very bottom of the cave is exposed magma, red hot rock. The water pretty much reaches the ceiling of this cavern, and 50 feet below the surface of the water is a sunken stone ledge that protrudes out. On that stone ledge is a magical half egg shaped bubble, but we'll cover that in the next entry. Water flows in through a tunnel in an underground stream about 100 feet below the level of the ledge. The water in the lake gets heated and boiled by the red hot magma at the bottom, and escapes as steam through a chimney in the far side of the cavern. This is Area 16. The steam going up that chimney goes all the way up to the top of the volcanic cone, giving White Plume Mountain its namesake. This is it right here. But do keep in mind, all of the water in this lake is at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, or 100 degrees Celsius, at all times. Area 17, The Boiling Bubble. A sunken stone ledge, which we drew earlier, projects out into the boiling lake. The corridor from the dungeon goes out into a domed area under a magical force field that keeps out the water by forming a sort of elastic skin. The shape of it is not square in cross-section, but semicircular, as if a series of hoops were supporting the ceiling. The corridor gives way to an oval-shaped domed area enclosed by the protective skin. Here lives the guardian of the treasure, a huge giant crab that has the following changes to its stats to increase its challenge rating. On one of its claws, it wears a rune-covered copper band that makes it immune to being charmed, frightened, and paralyzed. So this is a huge giant crab that seems to really value treasure. Huh. Why is this ringing a bell? Also at the north end of the domed area is a heavy chest firmly attached to the floor, and in it is Wave, the sentient trident, one of the three treasures that we're here for. Right on, let's get to it. This is gonna be a big tile, not as big as in the map. I know that I started this project under the guise of being no compromise, and since then I've done nothing but compromise, but really, this does not need to be as big as it's in the map. It's never gonna fit in my storage bin if I do that. So, starting with double corrugated, I'm gonna sketch out the oval here. If you don't know how to draw an oval, you can take two points, connect them with a string, and then just let your marker ride along it like you see here. That's how you draw an oval. The distance between those two points and the length of the string allow you to change the size and ovality of the oval, just FYI. And I'm sketching out where the underground stream comes in and where the blowhole will be. Attaching walls as usual, three quarter inch tall, hot glue, double corrugated cardboard, all the classics slathering with a good coat of white glue, and then installing my protruding stone platform, which is just more cut out double corrugated cardboard with some graphics medium chipboard attached on top for smoothness and rigidity. 
The rest of it gets flocked with my mix of fine sand. It's a construction sand, so it's got some mixed aggregate to it. Texturing the walls, my age-old trick for caverns and caves, draw a bead of hot glue across that corner where the floor meets the wall, and then tease it upward with the nozzle of the hot glue gun. Always upward. Gives the illusion of stalagmites. And I do that on the outside as well. Now, as expected, we've got some massive warping, totally expected. I flip it over, I paint on a healthy layer of white PVA glue, and let it sit for 24 hours. Not for three hours, which is when it will feel dry and you'll think it's done. No, you gotta wait a true 24 hours. And when you do this trick, if you happen to bias a little bit thicker glue toward the edges, eh, that'll help. That's the part that's curled up anyway. Here it is all fixed up, flat as a board, dry as a bone. I'll begin by painting lava. I've got a plain old orange here and a plain old red, though really you'll only need the orange. I'm going back to the water cup pretty frequently here to keep my brush full of water and then directly to the paint and then directly to the piece. This way, when it strikes the piece, the water and the paint mix, and you can see in the video here, you can see the capillary action of the sand sucking in all of that orange paint. Frequent trips back to the water jar when painting sand. The walls, on the other hand, get a solid, solid thick coat of black acrylic craft paint with a dry brush heavily loaded with black paint because I don't have the patience to do another coat. In hindsight, probably could have just spray primed the whole thing black and then painted the orange. But, uh, but I didn't. Also based the stone platform with a nice neutral gray. And moving on to finish the lava. Very simple. Dry brushing with black. Fairly little black paint on the bristles of the brush. And not using a whole lot of pressure. So it only catches the high detail of all that sand. And man, for the effort involved, that's some pretty good looking lava. Or magma. Magma liquid hot magma. Since I already had the black out, I watered it down and washed the stone platform, but it was a little bit rich, a little bit too dark, so I went back after it was dry and sponged on some more light gray. Looks like nucleate boiling anyway, which is what we've got going on in this room. And it only took like eight seconds to do that, so let me do that. I'll be back in eight seconds. And remember that our sponsor is Heroes Horde for you 3D printers out there. Excellent selection, including all True Tiles lines. Okay, the walls are finished up just like all the other tiles in the entire dungeon. I use that same gray and then the barn wood color, dry brushing them consecutively. Easy. As I tell you about the next step, I need to first tell you about something marvelous that has happened. After six years hawking their products, generating revenue untold, and generally championing that mana from heaven graphics medium chipboard, I have been in contact with and partnered up with Graphics Arts. That's right. And among all these cool samples they sent me, one of them is plastic film. Yes, or more accurately stated, craft plastic. The stuff is like, I don't know, half a millimeter thick. It's fairly rigid, and it comes with a protective film on both sides. Once you peel it off, it is perfectly clear and see-through. So I simply cut strips of it half inch wide, put in this cardboard form, and held the plastic strip against it as I hot glued the strip down on the outside of the egg only. This bead of hot glue will be subsumed in resin later on, so I'm not too worried about it aesthetically. And if anything, it looks like the raging tides of the boiling water against the skin on the outside anyways. Whatever. Yeah, that's effective. Then it was time to pour. Everything outside the bubble, including on some of the stone ledge, is boiling water. So I'm gonna use clear resin. This is Art and Glow. It's in my recommended supplies in the description below. You mix it 50-50, then you stir it very thoroughly. Then you have 40 minutes to get it poured. Little pricey, but awesome stuff and very reliable and crystal clear as you'll see in a moment. Usually I'm tinting these with some acrylic ink for some reason or another, but for this boiling water and this underground spring, no, it's going to be perfectly clear. These Starbucks cups are great. They have lines already on them. So with two of them, I could be sure that I was getting exactly a 50-50 mix of the resin and the hardener. Here we go. Ah, yes. Once you get underway, it's not so daunting. If you've never done a resin pour before, I was doing a live stream the other night and someone said they didn't have the guts for resin. I said, neither did I, and I still don't. But 
You can do it. Look, if I can do it, you can do it. Pour from a bit of a height to try and remove bubbles. Also, don't stir so aggressively like I did, or you'll froth the mixture and get those bubbles in the first place. That is why I have so many bubbles. But they eventually rise to the top and you can burn them away with the flick of a lighter or hot air from a hair dryer. Say that three times fast. 18 hours later, fully cured, glossy to the touch, not sticky at all, beautiful. Also, this thing weighs like three damn pounds. This is the heaviest tile I have ever made. That is a legit half to five eighth inch thick resin pour over a pretty wide area. And I think it perfectly represents that boiling lake that's being repelled by this magical clear elastic skin. Now that chest, I've also stopped overthinking chests. I take a large jumbo size popsicle stick, cut off the ends, and I've got some cereal box, wrap that around and attach with hot glue. Slather that with a watered down brown paint, wrap a thin bit of cardstock around it with some white glue and paint that banding with gunmetal, then glue on some bauble to serve as the padlock or the latch or whatever. And voila, five minute chest. And since this thing is permanently attached, I'm gonna go ahead and hot glue it on the tile. Yes, let's get a glamour shot of this little chest. Now coming up is its guardian, the crab. All right, buckle up because we need to talk about the crab. The model itself is 3D printed. I bought it on my mini factory and then printed it up on my Anycubic Photon. Printed resin models look great, but then once you spray prime them with gray, so much detail is instantly revealed and you realize they look even better than you thought. This is a huge miniature, but I decided to eschew a base. Yes, I use the word eschew. Now I printed this several months ago, not knowing exactly what I was going to do with it, but figuring it's a crab, it'll probably be red. So I'm going to base coat it in red while I have my airbrush out for whatever other project I was doing. Then, just a few days before editing this video, on a whim, I decided to do a live stream painting the crab. If you really want to, you can go watch that live stream, but in short, I painted it with an airbrush, then covered the carapace with white glue and flocked with gold glitter. And if you didn't get that reference a few minutes ago, I had a little fun with this model and took inspiration from Tamatoa from Disney's Moana. So that glittery gold carapace was looking great, but I still felt that it was missing something. Now, apparently, some of you have pointed out with varying levels of disgust that over the years I may have on occasion indulged in the use of some crafting gemstones in a arbitrary and perhaps tacky manner. Now I accept and recognize all criticism, constructive or otherwise, but I personally don't think this is that pervasive of a problem. These are Swarovski crystals. Some random gems. More bits. Gems and beads and stuff. Place some gemstones in the glue. But then I also hot glued on some of those flat back crafting gemstones. Stuck on some gems. And for the eyes I used flat back rhinestones. And then a couple more gemstones along the frame. Glued in some flat back gemstones to the eyes. That said, I did go ahead and be jewel. Them. Some costume jewelry from my random box. This needs a happy little gem. Two millimeter flat back gemstones. And some Swarovski crystals. So I covered those with red plastic gemstones. Quick little crafting crystal. I'm gonna bejewel the hell out of this thing. Okay, well it seems I have two options here. Buckle or lean in. Actually that's wrong. There are two options, but the options are lean in or lean in hard. So lean in hard is what I have done. A few years back, my wife's wedding ring had a few of its diamonds found to be damaged. So they were replaced, but I asked to hold on to the old ones because they had minor chips in them and no one else was gonna use them. Held on to them in the safety box for several years and realized this is the opportunity. I'm going to bejewel my craft with real diamonds. Here is one of the two. They are both genuine 0.3 carat round brilliant cut VS1 class F diamonds. To mount them, very simply, a graduated approach with a series of pin vise drills, a blob of white PVA glue because it will wash off if I ever want to unmount these, and then setting them in the shell. I just wanted to show you something painted this last night. Uh -huh. Sort of, it's a huge crab in the adventure, but I figured I'd paint it like Tamatoa and I like it. yeah, glitter it up. Do you like the carapace? 
Shiny. Do you like the carapace? That's the part on the back. Yes, I yeah. do. Do you recognize those? Are those from my ring? Yes. So this is real diamonds on it. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> love you. I love you too. All right. Bye. Bye. Oh, and one last thing, that circlet that's on its forearm, protecting it from spells. I went to my usual costume jewelry drawer looking for something that would fit. The only thing that really did doesn't look copper, like the text says, but I don't care. It really matches his color scheme, and it looks great. So I took this and super glued it on. Artistic license. This has been happening to me a lot lately. Benign elements of projects are just coming out very special for some reason. And then the things I'm excited about that I put a lot of energy into kind of fall flat. I don't know. I don't know. I will say the Flash live streams I've been doing lately have been helpful for my productivity. I feel weird sitting there in an awkward silence thinking and strategizing. So I am compelled to always be in motion, always doing something. And that is the reason that I got this crab done. Like I said, it's been sitting on the shelf base coated in red for months. And then, on a whim, over the course of 90 minutes, got it done. Because I had to. Uh, the rest of the video is downhill from here. I'll just be honest. You can jump ahead to the dungeon fly-throughs if you want to. Oh, we're going to do a few more rooms, but uh, none of them are as exciting. Before I do that, let's just take a little breather here. Let's just revisit the basic tile construction for this dungeon. I usually avoid wet work and wet blending because I like to move fast, so I tend to overbrush and dry brush, but the complexity and the undertones you can get by being patient and doing a lot of wet work like this, uh, you just can't simulate it. And there's a sliding door 10 feet away from my desk to the outside. I put them out there under the sun and everything is dry in about 20 minutes. Oh, on one of these tiles I tried a different dry brushing technique. Let me show you. First I did the walls as usual. But then I went to the floor and started to dry brush it with the usual barn wood color. And, and then here's what's different. I realized I forgot to flock the f***ing floor. So I had to re-white glue this, pull down the sand, redo that, wait for it to dry, rebase coat with black, rebase coat with brown. But thanks to the breezy outside, that only took about an hour and a half. Then I was back on track and dry brushing again. Beautiful. Room 18, Hall Pit. Halfway down the corridor is a 10 foot deep pit hidden under the water. I'm not modeling that. Room 19, Metal Heating Corridor. A series of copper colored metal plates lines the walls of the path before you. This is a trap. These plates produce an invisible electric field and the further down the hallway you go, the more all of the metal upon your person becomes heated. I love it. These are very simple clip-ons. Easy as it gets. 14 of them. Then base coated with a metallic copper. It's labeled copper, but it looks more like gold to me. And then I took another type of copper and just airbrushed some gradients at a slant on all the surfaces. This wasn't for any particular reason other than to give some color variation, make them a little more interesting. And I thought about doing a pale green verdigris. Verdigris? I don't know how to pronounce that. Maybe I'll add it later, but not for now. I do think in the last or second to last video of this series, I'll probably go back and do a touch-ups of the entire dungeon. You know, things I wish I had done differently. Anyways, there we go. 14 copper plate clip-ons. Room 20, Ghoul Ambushers. Behind the secret door, eight ghouls wait in ambush for intruders to come through the heat induction corridor. Seemingly pedestrian, but when you consider the fact that they've probably just sprinted through that hallway, out of breath, disoriented, and superheated, throwing anything at them at that point is going to be challenging. These two are 3D printed models. I bought them on my mini factory. And I finally have an opportunity to use this necrotic flash color from Army Painter that's been sitting on my shelf for like five years. First, I base coated with Army Green, and then a top down zenithal highlight with the necrotic flesh color. All oh, the airbrush is so powerful. Cannot recommend it strongly enough. It will change your hobby life more than any other tool. Look at this, with a light dusting from top down only, all the shadows naturally and immediately pop out. So satisfying. Let's do another one. Yes, watch the face. Watch the face as it suddenly comes into view. No need to wash. Oh man, love it. Let's do one more. 
And of course you could, and I have, washed after doing a zenithal highlight, but if you do that, you want to make sure to have a real strong contrast, more so than you see here. You want the two colors to be further apart because the wash really will damp down the brighter color. So if you want that contrast and shadows to shine through a wash, make sure the two colors are far apart. After that, it's back to conventional brush. I'll just throw a beige on their tattered cloaks, gunmetal on their shackles, washing those down with Agrax Earthshade, and not a wet brush. I'm using some pretty rich Agrax here. I'm counting on tide marks and staining to dull this down. And while that's drying, I did up the base. I like to do all my D&D miniatures with the same color base. Base coat with black, dry brush with Americana Slate Gray. I don't mind that they look different than the environment that they're in, as long as all the bases are the same, and black and gray is neutral enough to me. So there you have it. It took about 15 minutes to paint all eight of these. That is the power of the airbrush. I'm perfectly happy with the quality considering this is a one-off project and these will probably never be used. Room 22, Frictionless Trap. The path to the west is broken by a sizable gap and you can see the glint of metal at the bottom of the opening. The floor beyond this area has a silvery sheen. In the distance you can see another hole, beyond which is another patch of floor that adjoins the western wall. These openings are pits, and the bottoms are lined with rusty razor-like blades. Anyone who falls on them takes damage and might contract a disease called Super Tetanus. As for the silvery area, the walls, ceiling, and floor are covered with a substance that is completely frictionless. You know what's great about double corrugated cardboard? You can cleave off the top layer and create the illusion of depth in your 2.5D tile. So that's what I did for the pits. Then it was a matter of what do I use to represent the razors? So I went to my various junk bins and found the dollar store hair curlers. I forget how many times I've used these to represent things, but the inner cylinder, take that out, spray prime it with gray, paint it up with some shimmering silver. This Americana shimmering silver is my favorite silver. Every paint manufacturer seems to have one color that they're really good at. So like my collection has eight or nine brands in it, but it's because I want the ones with the best coverage. And this is plastic, so it cuts pretty easily with kitchen scissors. And I get a row of just sort of gnarly looking, I don't know, spikes or razor blades or something. It'll work. Just to experiment and play around with more of these Vallejo texture paints, I've got this thick Russian mud. I'm gonna fill the pit with that and use that as sort of a glue lay in these silver painted rows of razor blades, work them into the muck, and then sort of cover them up a little bit just to pin them down in a few places. And once that's dry, more Vallejo environmental effects. This is their rust texture. Some random dabbing all over the pit. Tie it all together, mucky it up. And I didn't film it, but the silvery area is very simply some cereal box, scored and folded and glued in place, then painted with that Americana shimmering silver. Done and done. And now let's have an overview of everything that I've built today. As I fly over everything, let me read to you a little more from entry 17 in the text. It has to do with the treasure in the domed area. Wave, the sentient trident, can be activated and cast a cube of force. It will instantly make the bearer aware of this property and allow the bearer to instantly become attuned to it if that person worships a god of the sea or is willing to convert on the spot. Characters protected by the cube will probably end up being blown out the geyser at the top of the mountain. The air-filled cube will float, drain down the cascade, and be ejected from the plume. A very rocky ride. Characters could also survive the boiling lake, if the skin is pierced, with a combination of immunity to fire damage and the ability to breathe water. I'm realizing that this dungeon isn't as large as Tomb of Horrors, not by a long shot. Progress is pretty smooth. I bet there's probably only two, maybe one episode left. I'll have to see how much I get done. We all know the big room that's coming up. 26 is going to take some time. Also in room 22, the frictionless trap, I didn't address the illusory wall on the far west side of the room. Having it there would give away meta knowledge to the players at the table that something is going on. Although, it might be useful in the future to build something that can be inserted once they realize what's going on. Oh, or what I should have done is made the overall tile smaller and then another two by one section to add on once they've realized that it's an illusionary wall. Ah, again, that's something for the punch list in the cleanup episode. Hey, crafting for your tabletop gaming is fun and you should do it. 
If you're new around here, I have a large back catalog of videos to watch, including a full build of the Tomb of Horrors, and be sure to find us on Facebook, the Tabletop Crafters Guild. Almost 40,000 members building cool stuff for their miniature tabletop role-playing games. Thanks for watching today. Until next time, I am Wylock. Make things, play games. Mm -hmm.